us the same message and he'll, he'll bring us into unity of the same um, thoughts that the Lord wants us to have and understanding. So, have you ever wondered why am I here? Or what is my purpose? Have you wondered that? Most of us have, have wondered that before. And if you haven't, then that's definitely something you may want to consider. Why am I here? And what is my purpose? What's the difference between a career and a calling? Is there a difference between the two? It definitely is. A career is something that you are trained and are paid to do, for the most part, right? But a calling, a calling is something that you were created to do. And the reward will be out of this world. <laughs> so you may have a career, which is wonderful, praise God. But God has made you for a special calling. Each and every single one of us, he has made specifically for his glory. And so, if you ponder on why am I here, what's my purpose, by God's grace, I hope you find what your actual calling is. Because once you figure that out, and once you allow the Lord to help you to do that which he has made you for, like um, um, Jim mentioned this morning, it would be, there will be no limits because God made you for that specific thing. And you'll be amazed at how high God can um, take you. So here's some facts. Anxiety, anxiety disorder are the most common mental illness affecting um, individuals in the United States. About 40 million adults in the United States over the age of 18, and or 18.1% um, of the population each year um, have some sort of anxiety disorder. Also, um, that information is, is coming from the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. The Center of Disease Control and Prevention says that the two leading causes of death in the United States is one, heart disease, and number two, cancer. And according to the End Homelessness Organization, 17 out of every 10,000 people in the United States are expressing, were, have expressed homelessness in a single night um, in January 2019. So based on um, these facts, we can see there's a lot of needs in this world. There's a lot of um, needs that people have, whether it be issues with um, mental health, whether it be with physical health, um, or with practical needs, right? A shelter. According to Southern Nazarene University, about 4.4 billion people have never heard the gospel. That's a lot of people. You would think that everyone has heard because of the internet and so on and so forth. But there's actually um, an area, um, a zone, which is um, not in this region, but um, towards Africa and in other regions where there's a lot of people who have not yet heard the gospel of Christ. So there's a need for people who have mental issues, um, health, other health issues, um, practical housing issues, and even spiritual issues. And so do you think that there is a need in among uh, just about everyone in the world? Amen. Okay, so there's a need then, we, then there must be a solution to the need, right? Amen. So let's look and see what Christ has to say about this. Christ is our example, amen? amen. And it says that in the book, Houses on Health, the Savior devoted more time and labor to healing the affected of the maladies more than preaching. We're told that Christ spent more of his time, more of his life when he was on earth in healing than he preached the gospel. What does that tell us? Christ is the example. What is an example? An example is something that is shown to you that you are able to copy. 
Otherwise, it would be an example. You would have to be able to duplicate and to, to, to do what that thing, and in this case, that person is Christ, he did. Christ's example um, demonstrated his love. And through his example, Christ spent most of his time helping those who are in need. He did this work so more than he did even preaching the gospel. So his example was a practical demonstration of his love. Amen? Amen. So, what did Christ do? Christ it says in back in Matthew 4, verses 18 to 23, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left their ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee. This is what Christ did. As he called the disciples, it says he went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all matter of sickness and all matter of disease among the people. Amen. So what does that tell us? Christ was a medical missionary. Christ's life was not um, one that was of, like we mentioned this morning in Sabbath school, that was profound how the Sabbath school message is completely tied to this message. Christ's life was a life of selflessness. Christ gave in all ways himself for us. And during his life, he showed us a practical demonstration of what love is. Christ healed um, the blind. Christ restored the demon-possessed man. Christ even raised the dead. Christ was all about restoration of man. And this is the reason why God sent the Father, I'm sorry, why the Father sent the Son to, the, to, the, um, to earth for us, for the restoration of man. Because we need restoration in a sense of mental, physical, and spiritual wholeness. In Isaiah 58, we find what is called the divine prescription. So what is a prescription? A prescription is a note that a doctor, a physician gives to someone that is sick, right? It's like orders of what they need, they need in order to get better. Well, in Isaiah 58, we have here a divine prescription. This is an order that was given from God for our healing. And it says in um, Isaiah 58, verses 6 to 8, it says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? This is the prescription. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye may break every yoke? It is, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. So here in Isaiah 58, the Lord is saying to us, for those who, this is, a, this is a prescription for everyone. For those who are in need, God is saying, help them. It's very simple. Help those that are hungry, Christ is saying, feed them. Those that are naked, Christ is saying, clothe them. This is a divine prescription to healing, not only for the people themselves, but it also is for your own soul. It is a double blessing when you help others because you also receive a blessing for your own selves. 
And it says in verse 8 that thy light shall break forth. What is this light that is going to break forth? As we go forward, as you and I are showing God's goodness to others, as we are doing as Christ did, practically demonstrating Christ's character, practically demonstrating Christ's love, what is happening? What is this light that will break forth as the morning and thy righteousness that will come, come before us, which is the glory of God? Well, let's see. Christians are to be the light of this dark world. How many of you believe that? We are. This is the reason why God has a people. He knows that there's a problem in this world. There's many problems. And Christ is a solution. And has, as Christians, we are to be like Christ. And so we are his workers here on the earth to bring forth his light to those who are in darkness. In Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16, it says, Ye are the light of the world. That's you, and that's me. It says that a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify who? Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So Christ is saying here in Matthew um, chapter 5 that we are the light of this world. And he purposed for it to be that way. And so the Lord needs us to let our light shine forth in this world and for it not to be hidden. And that light will be a light that will shine, shine the light of Christ so that who is glorified? Our Father which art in heaven. As the world sees this light, which is the character of Christ, they will get to understand who Christ is, who God the Father is. As mentioned in Sabbath school this morning, the disciples asked Christ about the Father. And Christ says, have I not been with you that you have, that you, you have not seen the Father? If you have seen me, Christ said, you have seen the Father. God wants to be that as individuals in this world see you and see me, who will they see? They'll see Jesus. We are to be that light that points to Christ and Christ points to the Father. Isaiah, Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2 says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. Okay, so I must have duplicated that, but in Isaiah 60, is saying to us to arise and shine. The light of Christ has come to us. His, the knowledge of Christ's character, which is to be duplicated in us, where we will be shining with this glorious, illuminating power, this, which is a reflection of Christ's character, his love which is inside of us, shining forth in this dark world. You know, the Bible says that darkness covers the world and gross darkness the people. We see many different things happen in the world at this time, but the saddest part is that people in themselves are filled with darkness in their minds. Many people don't know about Christ. They don't understand his character, as was mentioned this morning in Sabbath school. And there is what is called this great controversy, which is really about the true character of Jesus. And Christ's true character is a character of love. And in order for Christ's character to be justified, he needs you and I to co-labor with him to demonstrate what his true character looks like. So this is what the world is waiting for. The world is in darkness. They, they don't know. How will they know? Once you and I demonstrate a true practical demonstration of Christ's character, they will know that Christ's true character is a character of love. In Revelation 18, verse 1, the Bible says, And after these things I saw another angel 
Speaking of previously the three angels message, messages, which is in Revelation 14, we know the three angels messages. There was another angel in Revelation 18, this fourth angel. And this fourth angel came down from heaven, having great power, and the angel was lightened, and the earth was lightened with his glory. If you have not um, studied through the three of those messages, um, which is one to look into, we are those angels that the Bible is speaking of. We are, Christ is, is calling us, practical us, people, literal people, to be as angels, which are really messengers, to give forth the message of salvation to a dying world. And in Revelation 18, there was another angel. There are these special messengers that were lightened with glory. What is this glory? They had the character of Jesus. They were illuminating the world with his glory. Bright glory was shown from, uh, shown from them is what Daniel the Revelator, um, John the Revelator saw, um, which he wrote here in Revelation. He saw people who possessed Christ's true character, and these people went forth on the earth, enlightening the earth with the glory, which is the glory of Jesus. You and I are to be a part of this, um, this message in Revelation 18. The messengers who are demonstrating to the dark world Christ is true character. So Christ is now fitting us for the work. So if you have a job, you have probably went through some kind of training, right? Whether you went to school or whether they did some on-the-job training program, right? They fitted you to do the work. No one just hires somebody to do something and just say, go and do it. You have to be trained to do the job, right? So Christ is tra training us as well. The Bible says he does all things decently and in order. So if you look at the sanctuary, you have the outer court or the courtyard. And in the courtyard, you have the altar, the altar um, offering and the labor. Um, so when a person comes to Christ, they meet him there. And this is where they say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I need your help. And so they lay themselves, their life, their desires at the altar of offering. Then they go into this process where they say, I've studied and I've learned more about Jesus. And I believe these things in the Bible are true. And I desire to walk with Christ. I want to be baptized. They then venture to the labor which is still not in the outer courts. They plunge in the water of baptism. Now they want to start a new life. That old person I used to be, I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to walk in a new life with Christ. After baptism, they now enter in a new experience with Christ. They are in what's called the holy place of the sanctuary. But in the Christian journey, it's called the sanctification process. Here now, Christ is teaching them about him and he's molding their character so that it can be more like his. In this stage of the Christian journey, or in the holy place, there are three articles of furniture. You have a table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the seven branch candlesticks. So the table of showbread has the bread, which represents Christ and the word of God. So mansion that lived by um, uh, bread alone, but by every word. So here in this process, the Christian now spends daily time in the Word of God. So they can understand more about God. Not because somebody told them, but because they've learned it from His Word, who He really is. They also spend time in prayer. So this is where we have the altar of incense. They spend time praying to God. Praying, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Help me to love my enemies. Help me, Lord, to overcome this sin in my life. I'm praying also for so-and-so that needs your help. This is where they're experiencing the altar of incense. The prayer is going up to heaven. And then you have a seven um, branch candlestick. And this is where now their Christian character is being seen. 
because the candlesticks reveals light. And the light that is lit is now shown and the, the, the illuminates the area, right? So here now the Christian is living a life of light. And that light comes from who? From Jesus. So here, as the Christian is in that, that sanctification process, that Christian's life looks different from how it is before. The people who knew them before can figure out what's so different about them. You don't do this anymore. You don't do that anymore. What's going on? I am going through an experience with Jesus, and he is refining my character. And so the, the person's life is now showing who Christ is. And then you have the most holy place, and this is where we have Christ is now in the heavenly sanctuary where he is actually interceding for our sins in front of the Father. So this is where the light is coming from. We are to be that light. So Christ is in us for the work. Christ didn't say, okay, just go out and just tell people whatever. Christ wants us to go through an experience with him so that when we go out and meet with individuals, whether it needs to be a physical health, that they need help with um, a sickness, we can teach them about better lifestyle, better eating practices. If they are sad, if they have anxiety and depression, as we saw that a great number of individuals in America have, we can give them a word, encourage them, spend time with them. This is the experience that Christ wants to fit us for, that when we go out as his disciples, as medical missionaries, that we will know how he wants us to carry out this work. In Matthew 25, Christ, um, meant, there's three um, different um, illustrations given in Matthew 25. You have the parable of the 12 virgins in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, and the judgment of the Gentiles. So in a summary, um, the par parable of the 12 virgins, you have five virgins. Um, I'm sorry, the 10 virgins. I'm sorry, 10 virgins, not 12. 12 is a holy number. <laughs> I'm thinking of, thinking of the 12 um, the disciples or um, the tribes. But it's actually 10. And so you had five um, virgins. Um, they were all 10 waited. But five virgins awaited the bridegroom, and they had oil with them. They had prepared to meet the bridegroom with oil. But then there were five that didn't have enough oil with them as they waited for the bridegroom. The bridegroom represents Christ. They were waiting for the bridegroom to come. And the oil that they had in their lamps represented the Holy Spirit. So in order to receive Christ when he comes, we need to have the Holy Spirit. So here you have these 10 virgins. Five were preparing for Christ to come, and they had oil, they had the Holy Spirit, and they were ready to see the, the um, Lord. The other five did not take any oil with them, and their oil ran out, and so they were um, unprepared when Christ the bridegroom came. So this is um, an example of spiritual preparation. Christ needs us to be spiritually prepared to do his work. He needs us to be spiritually um, interested and willing to co-labor with him. You know, as um, 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 Jim Schmitter mentioned this morning about the Adventist church, we know a lot of things that people in this world have no idea about. We have been blessed with a lot of information and unless we truly understand the purpose of the, of the gospel and the mission that Christ came to give, we've missed it all. If we are able to tell prophecies, which we, shouldn't, uh, we should teach, right, because Christ taught, but if we don't appropriate things in the right order, we have done no justice to the gospel. Christ is the center of the whole plan of salvation. And Christ's character is a character of love. And if we are not able to not only articulate that to other people, but also demonstrate it,
we do not even ourselves know the gospel, because that is the gospel. These individuals that were preparing, they said, to meet Christ were actually not prepared. Could it be that individuals in and out of the church say they were waiting for Christ and then especially unprepared? They were waiting to receive the bridegroom, so they thought, so they thought but they did not have the Holy Spirit with them. And so they missed that spiritual preparation. In order for us to go forth and do the work that Christ has done, we need to also have spiritual preparation to do that work. Then there's the problem of the talents. And here, there was a traveling man who calls his own servants to increase talents given to them according to their own several ability. Some used the talents given and multiplied them, and one did not. This one buried it into the dirt. He did not do what he was told to do by his master. He was rebuked when his master returned. He did not use the gifts of practical ministry. So Christ wants us to be spiritually prepared, but then Christ wants us to be to do practical work. You see, God the Father sent his son as a practical demonstration of his love. God doesn't just say stuff and expect us to do it. He is such a God that he gives us an example of how to do it. That is beautiful. What he doesn't do or wouldn't do, he wouldn't think for you to do it. And this is why he is example. Because he did it, and so he, he came in a form of man so that we can do it also. That's why he's our example. So Christ was to have a, a spiritual preparation but then he expects us to do a practical work. Being a Christian is not just talking about God all day. The world is waiting for a practical demonstration of true Christianity. The individuals that received the talents, they were given the Bible says according to their several ability. Some people have a gift in one thing and another person has another talent. We are not to covet or want what another person has. God has a, a talent for you, he has a talent for me, and a talent for everyone else. And it is for us to ask the Lord to show us, what is my gift? What is my talent? What have you created me to do, God? And how can I use it to glorify you, to multiply what you've given me? This is what he wanted his servants to do. And some did multiply them, because everyone has a gift. And so... The gift that God gives to us, he gives it to us because he knows what he wants you to do with that particular gift. Everyone doesn't have the same <coughs> gift. Some will do, some have a gift in one area, and another person has another area, and it complements one another. If we all had the same gift, the whole work wouldn't be done properly. So the judgments of the Gentiles, this is the end of Matthew 25. It says, well, this is my summary. When Jesus returns, when Jesus returns, he will separate, when Jesus returns, he will separate the world into two groups. And we actually, um, in Sabbath school this morning, read in Hebrew, Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, um, verses um, 2 and 3, it says, Had in these, talking about God, had in, de has in these days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed here of all things, by whom also he made, also also made the world, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he did what? He sat down on the what hand? On the right hand of the Majesty on high. So Christ is. His, um, he, he is the, um, reflecting the, the glorious image of the Father. His brightness, his goodness is reflected. And it says that um, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Here when, um, in Matthew 25, when Christ returns, it says that he will separate the world to two groups. And those who are on the right same side, Christ sat on the west side, he's on the right hand, right? Christ will also bless his people on the same side. It says that those who um, are his sheep, 
that follow him, he's a good shepherd, he will also put them on his right side. And those um, who are represented as the goats who were disobedient, those will go on the left side and they will receive that, which is their reward. So why do those on the right, the sheep, get eternal life? Let's read what Matthew 25, 35, verse 40 says. Because in this parable, Christ spoke about, um, this, is the, the end of, this is the ending of the story of the, ten, of the talents. So after the talents in Matthew 25, Christ then talks about separating um, the world into two groups. And um, why does he have on one side, the, um, on the right side, the sheep, and whether they receive eternal life in the two groups? It says, in Matthew 25, verse 35, it says, For I was and hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these, of my brethren, you have done it unto me. So these individuals that Christ has on this right side, they, it's like they didn't even know what they were even doing. They didn't even realize that they were doing it to, to Christ himself. Christ said, as much as you help and provide for these individuals, showing that true character of love, it's as if you were doing it to me. Let's get a deeper look into that. In the book, Desire of the Ages, um, page 641, paragraph 3, it says, Love to man is the earthward manifestation of love of God. So when we show our love in our lifestyle, in our character interactions with others, this is an earthward manifestation of our love of God. Redemption in what is already inside of us. It was to implant this love to make us children of one family that the King of Glory became one with us. And when his parting words are fulfilled, love one another as I have loved you, John 15 verse 12, when we love this, the, when we love the world as he has loved it, then for us, his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts, in our hearts. So, Christ saying to us that when we have love in our hearts, Christ's character in us it will be manifested to one another in the earth. So why do those on the left side, the ghosts, why do they get condemnation? Or what is, why do they get death? Matthew 25, verses 41 tells us, till 43, it says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed it, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took, not, you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. So here we have in, we're still talking about Matthew 25. The, those three portion of Matthew 25 all tied to the same message. You have those who were sitting there waiting for Christ to return and they did not have the Holy Spirit with them. Then you have those that, re that received the talents and they were to multiply it but one didn't. Christ is saying to us, we need to be spiritually prepared to do his work. And when he gives us the work for us to do, we need to carry out his work with the motive of love. If we do this work, we'll be counted on the side of righteousness. We'll be doing his right work, revealing his true character to others. If we do not these things, we do not have the Holy Spirit in us, 
And we really weren't preparing for his coming, even though this is everywhere. And so, Christ is saying to those on the left, those that did not do, like the, the, the one that had to tell that dug into the ground, he's saying, you did not do these things. You're on the left side. As Christ beholds it all, and he says, it was I who was hungry and thirsty. It was I who was a stranger. It was I who was sick. It was I who was in prison. While you are feasting at your bountifully spread table, I was famishing in a hovel or the empty streets. While you were easy your luxurious home, I had not where to lay my head. While you crowded the war your wardrobe with rich apparel, I was destitute. While you pursued your pleasures, I languished in prison. When you doled out the pittance of bread to the starving poor, when you gave those flimsy garments to shield them from the bidding cross, did you remember that you were given to the Lord of glory? All the days of your life, I was near you. This is Christ, this is Christ um, um, revealing in um, Desert Ages. All the days of your life, I was near you in the person of these afflicted ones. But you did not seek me. You would not enter into fellowship with me. I know you not. So this is why Christ says to those that is on his left side and he does not know them. Because they did not, um, they neglected him. As they, ne as they neglected others, they are really neglecting Jesus. And they didn't enter into a fellowship with them. They did not show that love, character, that relationship. And so therefore, they, did, they never got to know him. They never got to know him. And so they denied him. And so Christ says, I know you neither. Love thy neighbor um, is the message. Those who Christ commends in the judgments may have known little of theology, but they have cherished his principles. Through the influence of divine spirit, they have been a blessing to those about them. There'll be many people in heaven that never knew half the things that we even know. But they understand the principles of love and they have used what they know for the benefit of other people. And so Christ, um, Christ commends them in the judgment. We're told that all may find something to do. There's a work for all of us, different things. Christ made us differently with different um, talents, according to our several ability. All may find things to do. The poor always you have with you, John 12, verse 8. Jesus says, and none need, left, none need feel that there is no place where they can labor for him. Millions upon millions of human souls ready to perish, bound in chains of ignorance and sin, have never so much as heard of, the Christ, heard of Christ's love for them. And we saw that this morning, that... Millions and billions of people have never heard the, have heard the gospel before. We were our condition, and there's to be reversed now. If we were in these other people's situations, those that were in need, what would we desire them to do for us? All this so far as lies in our power, we are under the most solemn obligation to do for them. Christ's rule of life, by which every one of us must stand or fall in a judgment, is... Whatsoever, whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. And so as I'm closing down now, it says, In the great judgment day, those who have not worked for Christ, who have, drift, who have drifted along thinking of themselves, caring for themselves, will be placed by the judge of the world, of the whole earth, with those who did evil. They receive the same condemnation. So, those who have not worked for Jesus in the work of um, helping to restore their fellow man, showing the true character and demonstrating love to them, Christ is saying that they are in um, the same category as those who actually did evil because they actually are neglecting to give light to those who are in darkness. It says that um, all Christ gave a, a um, told of, um, it was told by his own self, as a, um, a seed or a grain, that he had to die for the salvation of our, for our salvation. And if Christ was like how we usually are, self, um, selfish, we would have no salvation. 
but Christ is filled with selflessness. So he gave himself for us to live. So he gave an uh, illustration as to where if someone had a seed, you have one seed and one, only one seed. If you ate that seed, what, what then happens to the seed? It's gone, because you ate it, right? If you took that, that same one seed and you buried it into the ground, what happens to that seed? It multiplies and it grows. And now who can be fed? More people. So we're told that all who would bring forth fruits as workers together with Christ must first fall into the ground and die. The life must be cast into the furrow of the world's ground and die. Self-love, self-interest must perish. And the law of self-sacrifice is a law. The law of self-sacrifice is the law of self-preservation. So you want to preserve your life? You want eternal life? The law for that is self-sacrifice. If you are willing to give of yourself and of your time for other people, Christ says this is the law of self-preservation. You are giving. It's like you're taking that seed and you're putting in the dirt. That's a self-sacrifice. The seed went into the ground to benefit others. It says to give is to live. The life that will that will be preserved is the life that fully give in service to God and man. But if we don't give that seed, if we ate that seed, thinking only of ourselves, this is what is it that the illustration Christ gives to us. The life spent on self is likened is like he. Let me repeat that. The life spent on self is like the grain that is eaten. It wasn't buried. There was no sacrifice. It's all about self. Let me eat this last grain, okay? It disappears, but there is no increase. It's not going to grow anything new because it was eaten. It didn't grow into the ground, right? A man may gather all he can for himself. He may live and think and plan for self, but his life passes away and he has nothing. The law of self-serving is the law of self-destruction. So Christ is saying to us, you want to preserve your life? Self-sacrifice. Give to others. Give people some of your time. Give people, you know, they have a need, meet their need as you can according to his will. So why haven't Christ yet returned, you may ask. We spoke about these things, um, alluded to them this morning in Sabbath school. According to the book in Ministry of Healing, uh, page 142, paragraph 2, it says that the world needs today what it needed, what the world needed 1,900 years ago, which is a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded, and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration of physical, mental, and spiritual needs can be accomplished. So why hasn't Christ returned yet? He's waiting for you and for me to demonstrate his character. He's waiting for us to illumine this dark world with his glory. When that is done, then Christ can come and receive us as, as his own. Amen? Amen? So the question for you and me was, is, will you accept the call? You may have a job right now, but Christ is calling you to a higher calling. He is asking for you and for me to enter into co-laboring with him to be fishers of men for the salvation of souls. This is the highest calling upon any human soul. Could you imagine? God wants us to live with him for the salvation of other people. Christ tells us, if you do this, self-sacrificing for others, it is even for your own self-preservation. Um, if this is your desire, would you please um, stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, Rescue the Perishing, hymn number 367.